and just some of my thoughts on why we fail. Um, my disclosures are all in the program. So I think one of the benefits of being an old guy is we, we start publishing more about our failures than we do our successes. And probably our last six papers have been about how we fail and trying to get a little bit more granular in terms of preventing failure, which has been far more interesting than just talking about how we can generally be successful. And what we often say is, well, there's about a 75% success rate for all these things that we do, independent of how we choose. But the truth of the matter is that it's, there's a lot of uh, decision making and um, um, inputs that go into uh, choosing what we do. So to say that all things are equal, I think, would be a true mischaracterization. And there are dramatic differences uh, based on the selection bias we have in terms of what we know clinically. Uh, but uh, you gotta be, you got to be decisive. Just uh, be decisive. Uh, right or wrong, make a decision. The road of life is paved with flat squirrels who couldn't make a decision, okay? So cartilage repair is probably one of the most uh, challenging aspects of making a decision. There is no cookbook approach. And to that point, this is an algorithm. When I first came out in practice in 1997, we were trying to figure out, you know, how we can organize our decision making as it relates to cartilage repair. And all we really had at that time was defect size. And we say, well, the small ones we just debris, and the big ones we put an osteocon allograft, and everything else is in between, and there's a lot of overlap. But we've gotten much more granular over time, and you see lots of algorithms like this that have been published, and truth be told, they're not really evidence-based in totality, but we have good clinical judgment based upon our experience in terms of decision-making based on location, the status of the meniscus, alignment, uh, status of the subcondyl bone, is it a primary, is it a revision, what's the demand level of the patient, and so forth. And then always uh, what's available to you. We, we may choose something, for example, in the United States, different on the East Coast than the West Coast based upon what's clinically available. So lots of variables, and it doesn't always line up. But this is generally, at least in the United States, where we are today. If you look at the frequency in terms of how, how frequent these things are performed, and you move along the lineage all the way down to the most mature cartilage, which would be an osteochondral allograft. And then the question is, if we're talking about failure, how do we actually define it? And um, we've, we've looked at this, we've talked about it, we say, well, maybe it's just continued unacceptable pain and dysfunction. Or a patient who undergoes a repeat arthroscopy and debridement. Or maybe they have to have a revision cartilage transplant. What does that look like? And finally, they go on to arthroplasty. One of the biggest challenges that we've discovered is that we have certain patients who just never get better from point A to Z, if you will. And by the time they go on to arthroplasty, they still don't respond like our other patients who have osteoarthritis, for example, in terms of clinical outcomes. So we probably uh, have more unanswered questions than we do solutions. So I put together some things uh, to think about to, to minimize failure, if you will. Well, I think the first thing is asking people you trust. So if you're a clinician, uh, that's been the most uh, satisfying aspect of my career. Uh, but also, we never stop learning. We're always a student, and I will say it is a, on a weekly basis we speak to our colleagues uh, doing translational research. Uh, this is probably one of the most important aspects of my career, and I'm very fortunate to have individuals who I collaborate with. I have Susan Chumitskaya in the room. Uh, we work together to identify, hey, this is a really simple problem. Let's take it to the lab. Let's take it to an animal model. And, 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 and in an efficient, cost-effective way, let's figure out how we can solve it and bring it back to the clinic. And that's something that's been also very satisfying over the years, uh, just trying to identify simple problems and come up with solutions that we can bring back to the clinic. A big one is uh, just managing our patient's expectations. I always will ask my patient, what would you like to see happening? happen following treatment. It's really basic, right? So a lot of things that we do in orthopedics are sort of an off switch. A patient may have a very discrete meniscal tear without osteoarthritis. They may have a rotator cuff tear, an unstable shoulder. We fix it, they get better, and we move on. And sometimes they forget which joint they even had a problem with. But in articular cartilage repair, meniscal deficiency, malalignment, and so forth, it isn't always an off switch. It's more of a light rheostat, and patients have to understand they may have ongoing problems, or I should say symptoms, but that doesn't mean that they haven't achieved a good or excellent outcome. And they have to understand not only to manage their expectations, but we manage our own. Reassurance is a lot of, of what we provide in the office. And this is a great quote that I use all the time from Voltaire. Voltaire says, the art of medicine consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. So I'm sure many of you have seen this before. And what's really interesting is that patient symptoms tend to sort of regress to the mean. Like we catch them in a clinical setting when they're symptomatic, but one month later they may have no symptoms at all. So there's a lot of uh, oscillating, waxing and waning in terms of how people feel. Um, another one that is important is, uh, I want to see something. I thought I had another slide I wanted to share with you. Okay. Another one that's really important is don't move too fast. 
So uh, don't mistake my fast speaking with my decision making in the office, okay? Uh, we tend to move very slowly. And um, I say that because of that concept that patients tend to regress to the mean. In other words, patients when they're counseled that doing nothing may not lead to a worse place later on is a really important principle that they need to understand. People think, look, if I'm in pain, I must do something now or I'll end up with a different solution later on and God forbid a knee replacement. So we do less about the natural history, for example, than we do for treating the here and now. And we've become very keen on uh, looking at how patients do from simple things like when they present for presumed transplantation, what are the risk factors that may lead them to make a quick decision after their initial surgery to say, I need something else done. And that can help us think about single and double stage procedures, right? We have a lot of two stage procedures that we now do, many of them are cell based, for example, that we say, look, we'll get index arthroscopy, get the information we need, and then come back later on and do definitive treatment. But there is a group that has, say, for example, femoral condyle lesions uh, who have high pain scores, high physical scores, and bad Amadeus scores, where MRI is really involved with large defects, subchondral edema, and so forth. Those patients predictably do not do well with debridement and often make very early decisions to go on for transplantation. So just things to think about from a, a clinical perspective. And then there's the concept of embracing the placebo. So this I find really fascinating. All of us as clinicians have a placebo effect. Um, and the more invasive we are, the more likely it is to have a placebo effect, and I'll share another slide with you on that. But these are two studies that we were involved with, and we looked at normal saline and said, hey, if you look at the best literature, level one studies, what's the impact of normal saline versus everything else is clinically active? And the, those who met the MCID did as well with normal saline as they did with hyaluronic acid or corticosteroids. So then we said, and this is a serendipitous finding, was a study with lorisavent where we did a subgroup analysis in those who had a sham injection versus those who had saline. And those who had sham fared just as well as they did with saline. So that sort of puts to rest, at least provisionally, the concept that saline may have some physiologic response. It's part of being in a clinical trial that has the response. And this is, this is a book that I just recently read. How many of you have read this in the room? All right. So. If, if you're, it's one I highly recommend. Um, and, and, and I think as a surgeon, it's important to read, and I think it's very real. So placebo is the difference between the direct effectiveness of surgery on a physical level, like it actually does something real, and the perception of the effectiveness of surgery. Surgery when, is really, when you think about it, probably the perfect placebo that takes lots of planning. It has a very large therapeutic envelope. Patients drive an hour to see you, they wait an hour, they wait an hour in, the, in the reception area, they come in, they have a five minute visit, then they meet 25 other people before they actually get a surgical intervention. And it's uncomfortable, it's sometimes it's invasive, the whole process is very time consuming, and by both the clinician and the patient, there's a strong desire to get better. So that's not to say that surgery doesn't have valuable value or affect change. What I'm saying is there is an impact on the experience itself that leads to a, a positive outcome. And I think those are just things to think about from an outside the box perspective. Chronologic age is also important in our world. And, 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 and the way it matters is that we do have patients who are older that present with the same type of disease as our younger patients. And I don't actually have a year cutoff to tell you because we've looked at over 40 and under 40 in our cartilage uh, restoration procedures, and if we have careful decision making, we don't, always, we don't always show a difference. But the point is those who have lived with their disease process longer, who have a more deeply entrenched symptom pathway, they tend to be a bit less responsive to cartilage repair procedures. Okay? So all things can look equal, but as they age, they just behave differently in my experience, in our experience when we look at our outcomes, than our younger patients with the same disease. We do discuss a lot about prior surgery and prior treatment in terms of having an impact on future treatment. So this has been discussed by a number of authors. For example, marrow stimulation, does it affect the outcomes of, 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 of a cell-based technology later on? And I would tell you that this isn't what we, we didn't find the same uh, outcome, for example, in the STAR study, where it was a prospective evaluation of patients who failed previous treatment, many of whom who failed marrow stimulation. Uh, we didn't find the same thing in osteochondral allografts either, and we didn't find the same thing we did osteochondral allografts after ACI. So it just, the take home is that we have to be very careful about generalizing to say if they have a very sp specific prior treatment, it doesn't necessarily preclude the next treatment, and there's a lot of other independent variables that are active. 
Number nine, recognize the impact of load. I think this is the biggest factor of all, uh, and it translates into what we do day in and day out. Uh, load uh, in terms of alignment. We know that people, when they get realigned, they get better, and sometimes we don't have to do anything for the cartilage problem itself. We know that when patients lose weight, there's probably a five to seven pound difference uh, at the level of the knee for every pound we lose above the knee. So none of us as clinicians should be afraid to speak to our patients about this issue. And this is just a case in point. This is one of dozens of my patients who come in with this one in particular had anterior knee pain. Um, she understood the, 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 the benefits of therapy, understood the, weight, the benefits of weight loss. And within eight months, she became a life coach. She teaches other people how to manage weight with, uh, with fitness, training, and nutrition. And all of her pain is gone despite having uh, grade three, four changes uh, behind her patella. So it can be very, very effective. Uh, and I think what's most related to this load concept and the last point is just respecting the bone, okay? So we talk about comorbidities, and I, I know when people say, well, we're going to talk about failure, the first thing I was going to talk about is respecting comorbidities. I think that's, at this point, it's a foregone conclusion. When we treat a cartilage problem, we treat meniscal deficiency, we treat ligament deficiency, we treat malalignment. In my mind and many others, the lowest hanging fruit is the malalignment problem. And when you put metal and plastic in a joint, that's a load sharing procedure. When you do realignment operation, that's a load sparing procedure, right? When you lose weight, you put orthotics in, maybe that helps you wear an unloader brace. All those things speak to the fact that load matters and the bone matters. I know everyone in this room has a specific interest in replacing cartilage, as do I, but many times once the patients get to us, it's no longer a cartilage problem, it's a bone problem. It's a organ failure that is so far beyond the cartilage itself, and it speaks to why osteochondral solutions whether it's synthetic or, or organic, can actually have a huge impact, and it moves beyond the fact that cells or surface treatment is not the only option. So just things to think about that may lead to reducing failure. These are just a qu couple quick exa case examples. This is a patient who had a previous marrow stimulation. You can see good fibrocartilage fill, but significant changes in the subcondylar bone, which may or may not matter, and the, the decision for me was easy to move on to an osteochondral allograft to treat that failure. Another patient who had a, a beautifully healed patella osteochondral allograft who came back for, with repeat symptoms and had something very simple. You know, there wasn't anything sinister here. This patient simply just had an, a new meniscal tear, had symptoms that were lining up in that fashion, and responded favorably to a second scope, but only needed a meniscectomy. Another patient who had a previous ACI of the patella, which needed to be debrided, com complained of mechanical symptoms, but also had a new trochlear defect that we found, and we performed marrow stimulation. I no longer use an awl when I do marrow stimulation. I always drill it. I may add something to it. Uh, but it just speaks to the fact that patients are entitled to develop new problems in addition to the one that we treated initially. Another example, an osteochondral autograph. The patient continued to have pain, had subchondral change, had unstable flaps, revising very simply with an, uh, an osteochondral allograft. And then this is probably the hardest patient we have. It's the patient who has a structurally intact graft, looks perfect on MRI or CT scan, yet continues to have pain. So as I started out, I said, look, there is a population that we treat that we do not understand why they hurt. We throw everything at them from A to Z. Even if they head to arthroplasty, when my partners do arthroplasty, they still don't have the same subjective benefits that traditional patients do with underlying osteoarthritis. And I don't think it's because they underwent cartilage repair procedures. There just is a breed of individuals who do not respond to things that we do, despite paying attention to all these details. So these are some general summary points on managing and preventing failure. We treat the here and now rather than what might, this is my philosophy, that treat the here and now rather than what might happen tomorrow. The natural history of these problems is profoundly heterogeneous, and some patients will never have problems with their articular cartilage disease. I always ask patients, and we ask ourselves, what is it exactly that you wish to see happen? And ask yourself as a clinician, can I actually deliver, in my experience, in the literature's experience, can we actually deliver what this patient is asking for? I do believe it's okay to debride as first-line treatment, as it's often very useful, not just for index information, but there is a, there is a group of patients who will respond favorably to debridement, so I don't th think we should throw that one out. Uh, we should identify patient-specific factors that could be modified. And that could be anything to how they interpret their problem, providing reassurance, weight loss, uh, braces, uh, smoking, um, anti-inflammatory diet, supplements, all those things can make a difference. There's also obviously the organ-specific factors, the comorbidities that we all talk about, meniscal status and malalignment being the, the two most common. And as I've alluded to, the largest benefits come from directly re reducing load. 
Um, the rehab does not follow cookbook approach, right? So you say, well, I do Macy of the thermal condyle or the trochlea, they all get non-weight bearing. That non-weight bearing is a kiss of death for patients. Putting a patient in a brace is a kiss of death for a patient. So any time we can spare them from being in a brace or putting them on crutches is the best way to get them rehabilitated in the soonest. So the procedure doesn't dictate necessarily their weight bearing status. This is just one example, but rather the location you're being treated, right? So we weight bear our patients who have patellofemoral disease, full weight bearing out of the gates with a brace unless they have a tubo tubical realignment. Um, Finally, high demand patients can achieve a satisfying result, but be prepared to fail uh, in that population as we do far more predictably well with ADLs than we do for the highest level of activity. So patients will often say, look, I do have problems with lower level activities, but I want to get back to uh, high impact loading. I want to get back to professional football. Uh, I want to get back to, to um, um, a, a, an impact sport with cutting and pivoting. Will I be able to do this? Well, we have lots of literature that says we, that they can achieve this goal, but they actually have to have sufficient pain relief and the willingness to expose themselves to the incremental risk associated with doing that. So it's a complex process. We do a lot better with people who come in and they say, I just want to be active recreational ADLs, things of that nature, that's often a slam dunk if we have good decision making uh, in the end of the day. But just keep in mind, be prepared to fail for our very high demand patients who don't always, who's out, whose activities outstrip the ability of our procedures to provide them symptom relief. And then this is my uh, last take home points that are kind of procedure specific. Uh, I debride those with new onset mechanical symptoms. I will consider drilling, uh, protect the weight bearing post op for weight bearing lesions, and I'll often add something to it in marrow stimulation. Could be particular cartilage, uh, could be orthobiologic, and so forth. Uh, I do osteocon autographs, but uh, for my higher demand patients, as first line treatment, but those are usually for small defects that are not involving the patel from a joint. That's my bias. Osteocon allografts can be done anywhere, anytime, as long as you can get them. Uh, not great experience in the tibia, but you can actually use it for bipolar disease otherwise. Um, Macy, anywhere with healthy bone, uh, multifocal disease, especially our younger patients, uh, it can be done as first line treatment with good or excellent results. And osteotomy and meniscal transplant, um, really that happens um, anytime possible, right? So that's always that percolating in the background in our decision making. Uh, adding that in, it's not all about the cartilage, the bone and the load matters most. So thank you very much.